after almost six weeks of trial and more than 70 witnesses, over 500 pieces of evidence, and about five days of, deliber of deliberation, um, we have a unanimous verdict that was properly accepted by the court, not guilty as to count one, malice murder, and guilty as to count two, felony murder, count three, aggravated assault, count four, possession of a firearm during the commission of a felony, and count five of influencing the witness. The state will not, will not present any evidence in aggravation. If the court will allow the presentation of the impact statements, um, we would like to start with Mr. William Corey. Good afternoon. My name is Jay Grover and I'm a friend and co-worker of Diane's. I've known Diane for over 40 years. Her death, death left a huge void in the hearts and lives of many and that void can never be filled. Professionally, Diane was the savviest, shrewdest, and smartest businesswoman I have ever known. She was fiercely competitive and when she set her mind to do something, she was relentless in achieving her goal. She was driven. She had a sharp tongue and a sharp wit, but anyone who truly knew Diane also knew of her concern and compassion for her close friends and coworkers. The complexion of our company has changed immensely since Diane's death. Because of the intentional actions of this now convicted murderer, Diane's loud and boisterous laughter will no longer be heard in the hallways of Corey Center. We will no longer see Mommy Dive's eyes light up and see a smile spread across her face when her beloved godson, Austin, runs into the room. Doc Felton and Cassie and Christy and I will no longer have our favorite partner in crime to sing way too loudly and way off key with the concerts, especially at Luke Bryan concerts, by far David's by far Diane's favorite country singer. The intentional actions of Claude Lee McIver and one shiny silver bullet caused grief, heartache, pain, despair, and left a huge void in the hearts and lives of many that can never be filled. Claude Lee McIver. So Mr. Grover and anyone who follows is pretty important. Talk to me. Um, don't talk to anyone else in the courtroom. This is a chance to share with me uh, what you think I ought to do, how this situation has affected you and folks close to you and Ms. McGuire. Thank you. You're welcome. Good evening. Hello, Ms. Williams. As a minister, I realize when we say goodbye to one another, we never know if it's going to be our last. I'm still haunted by the look on her face that bright, and we'll never know what she was really feeling. First, I want to say that I have come to a place in my heart, and I have found peace and forgiveness.
forgiveness. And I hold no anger or hostility towards anyone. However, I would like for it to be known that a hole has been left in my heart and the heart of those who really loved her. The actions have traumatized me. I lost sleep and I had nightmares because I so wanted to believe that it was an accident. But there was no compassion or consideration shown for our employees. We never got any explanation. We never got a, I'm sorry. We were never even told personally that I loved her and that I would never do anything to hurt her. She deserved so much better. As an adopted family member of 20 years, I was never given the final opportunity to say goodbye or farewell. We never knew when she was cremated, where her service would be. I read it in a newspaper. I would think after 20 years, someone would have compassion and say, there's going to be a service. Everyone's not going to be invited, but I would like you to know that she is going to be put at rest. And that final words could have been said, even from my desk. I was never allowed that opportunity. Diane and I shared many plans and made few plans for the future that I will now have to continue on without her. She will only see them come to pass from a distance now. The president of my company was not just taken away, but someone very special, someone that was loved, so full of life, a friend and a confidant. Because of the way her remains were handled, I have no closure. It's as if she said goodbye to me on Friday afternoon and simply walked out into space, never to be seen or heard from again. She deserved so much better. However, there is no victory or rejoicing here today. One life was lost, so many left hurting, a family shattered, and a bright future destroyed. With that, I can only pray God's mercy on us all and that we all come to find peace in this situation. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Williams. Dagger lied to me and tried to get me to lie. His friends tried to intimidate me and insult me. He tried to use me and this innocent 11 year old boy to make himself look more likable. It didn't work. I would like to say that I forgive him for the tragedy of Diane's life. I cannot live with the resentment, nor is it my place to judge. This has been one of the saddest and most horrific incidents that have happened in my life. I lost my friend of over 40 years. That was more like a sister than a friend. It broken my heart. Lost is the friend that I ran all of my important decisions by. The friend you call when someone, something amazing or something bad happens. I still start to call her, to talk to her, and I have to stop. I dream about her often. To have, the pres to have been present at the time of her murder has caused me great distress and horrible trauma in my life. Diane was a unique woman with many great qualities. She was smart, beautiful, challenging, loving, and fun. The perfect balance of toughness and tenderness. I loved her <coughs> very much, very very much her like blood. I miss her terribly. My belief is that Diane <coughs> is in a better place now, free from conflict, evil and innuendo. I will see her there one day. And in the words of Mr. Clint Rucker, I stand for Diane. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Carter. Mr. Rucker, anything else on behalf of the state? No, sir. All right. Thank you. Defense. Ms. Clark Palmer. Um, um, 
Your Honor, I agree that this is a very sad day for everybody involved, including my client, Mr. McIver. Um, I think it's a sad day for Diane's friends um, and the people who consider her family, as well as Texas friends and family who are here. I think it is most sad for Tex McIver, um, in part because you have to sentence him to a life sentence in prison. And given his age, um, it is likely that he will never leave. Um, obviously, we disagree with the jury's verdict, but their verdict has taken away any meaningful discretion from the court. So that's why we're asking for the life with the possibility of parole sentence. But I don't think that that is the only reason that this is an incredibly sad day for Mr. McIver. Um, he also misses Diane. As you heard during the trial, Diane was his wife, his best friend, um, his lover, his soulmate, and he killed her. Um, and he has to live with that and has lived with that since she died. And even if he had been acquitted by the jury, he would have lived with that guilt with the rest of his life, for the rest of his life. You heard from many witnesses about the wonderful relationship that they had, and that was not disputed by anyone. Ann Schwal wrote a letter to the court, and she described Tex as being full of love and patient and kind. And she talked about his work as a mentor at the college in Milledgeville. Um, his friend Billy Brown called him courteous, respectful, and a true gentleman. And his younger sister Dixie, who's here today and was here for, I think, all of the trial, or at least most of it, um, told you that she looks up to Tex and is extremely proud of him, not just because he is her big brother, um, but because of the selflessness that he exhibited um, in volunteering and doing things for other people. Um, that also is mentioned in Richard Brock's letter. Um, you know, he said that he lived for Tex for a year when they were in the military in, in Vietnam together, and he found Tex to be a compassionate person, and that Tex befriended many of the local people that worked around their office, got to know their family history, and would give them um, money and financial assistance if any of them were having a family emergency. And then his younger brother, um, John McIver, wrote that Tex has always been an achiever, that he was an Eagle Scout when he was 14 years old, class president in high school and college, and then went on to success in the Air Force and in law school. And his other family members, like his daughter-in-law, Leslie, um, wrote extensively about his generosity and compassion towards other people. And this was echoed by um, her husband, who is uh, Robbie McIver, Texas son, who said that his father is always giving back to his community. I wish I could ask the court to do more in terms of the sentence, but we are where we are. And so I think that um, Mr. McIver would like to address the court now. Given these shackles, it would be no matter what. That's okay. The limited time I have here today, I'd like to use notes if that's possible. I find that without notes, I'm more emotional and more broken up. So, so there might be more cogent to you. I would like to use those. And for really two different purposes. One is that received a tremendous amount of labor uh, challenging our system and asking why I am not a champion of some challenge of that system. I want to just very briefly describe <laughs> if I'm ever allowed to respond how I would do so. And then I want to close by thanking those who have been great supporters of mine. And uh, I'll, I'll do that.
three feet from individuals on three different continents. Um, one I would like to point out is because it seems to be fairly common is the lady from Ireland. Her name is Diego Kenny from Dublin, Ireland. And she said, Dear Mr. McGuire, you do not know me, but I watched your trial online and I wanted to write to offer you my support. The injustice done to you is shocking. Your sister gave me your address. I know that a lot of people see through these lies. Thank you. Uh, for some reason, that is, seems to be the outpouring uh, that, that I'm finding. I would like to uh, at least refer to a couple of people who are offshore that are just so faithful and supporting me. Um, uh, of course, this lady, then uh, uh, Maria Schneider, that sends me recipes. She knew anything about the quality of food in jail, so you'd never do that because it's more punishing than it is helping. But uh, again, she's uh, very supportive in that respect. Um, then there is the most unique individual I think that I've ever corresponded with. His name is Trent Jones. He's a, he's a racehorse jockey in Perth, Australia. And his girlfriend was killed in a very tragic accident as we saw at the trial decided to uh, begin corresponding with me and uh, it's been very helpful as we have jointly through correspondence with war. But uh, what is unique about him is that his favorite resource, Hubart, um, has been retired just this year and that now he and Hobart are free to step into the surf and birth and, and play that they uh, were unable to do with birth when uh, Hobart was running. They always asked that pass that along to others as well. Um, in addition to those that I have never met, I have a list that I won't board the court with of about 60 individuals locally that have been very helpful to me in terms of their support. Neighbors bringing me food while I was in house arrest, friends delivering Chick-fil-A, one of my huge, huge favorites, one of the things I miss the most, I guess about uh, food in jail, but they've been remarkably kind to me. Uh, even non-lawyers are often to write amicus briefs, which um, I find a little bit astounding. Uh, but I trust they'd be usually going to leave in that respect. Nonetheless, um, those people are very, very important to me, and, and all of that is heartfelt, especially, and I'm sure a number of those people in the room today. Uh, also, Second to last uh, would be my family, uh, both blood and extended. Grandchildren who send me drawings with me as the hero in a picture story they've drawn, hoping to see me soon. Summer in California, which is a long way, but we, uh, we don't get to get in there enough. Um, then I'm the proud godfather of approximately 23 children best I've been able to reconstruct and remember, now, not the least of whom is Austin that we've heard something about. Um, Austin and Diane and I, he was part of the permanent part of our relationship. We were there, we held him when he was born. When his mother became ill, we took him and did all the four o'clock feedings and so on. And did some very serious bonding with him at the time. Um, there was some small amount of influence Diane and myself. He today is still a straight A student. He's an all star on his basketball and baseball leagues. Um, his uh, first all star baseball game was on Saturday, and he asked if anybody in the office would like to attend. He'd be happy to have him come. He's the only left handed pitcher on the team. Um, and he's a huge fan of the Golden State Warriors. And instead of anything, I had to say, Go Warriors. I'm not sure how I'm going to accommodate missing him as much as I do. He's, he was so, such an integral part of our relationship. And then finally, under family, would be Tammy Johnson, who's the lady that's coordinated for us and helped me get through the changes that I'm going to have to make in my life. So, extremely valuable person. And then we've heard about my sister. And uh, to correct Amanda, just mildly, uh, I don't think Dixie, my sister, missed a day of trial. She's from Texas. She uh, leads a very active and busy life there. She 
sort of that like <coughs> came here to assist me in lots of ways. He's been here for the last week helping with some other things involving my estate uh, to the extent of a dying prison. Helps constantly. Uh, she's filled with unfettered love. And uh, I'd like to proclaim, as I've done many times before, she is America's last living saint.
receive you and receive the corrections and go forward. I don't ever remember a time I was spiritual in that respect. Just that was the nature of our devotion to each other. Um, since this tragedy, I have spent 263 nights in a jail cell by myself, but not alone. If you join me there, it's a presence, it's hard to describe, but she has left her birth suit, and after the, the three different ceremonies we had for her, two in Atlanta for celebration of life, and one in Texas for celebration of life, where we tried to say goodbye to her, she never said goodbye to me, and she's been there. It's as if she's on the other side of a curtain or in another dimension. It really is true that if you're that close to each other, and this is obviously my first experience with it, that they are there. They are absolutely there. And I've never felt alone in that respect. It has meant so much to me in that way. On this earth, she was my life and made me complete. And certainly not that way now. But if I might just say to her directly, because I know she's here, I feel her presence as I'm speaking to her. Darling, you have brought me more joy and fulfillment than few men on this earth have ever known. Thank you until we are together again. Because it is truly for you. It is truly for you. Thank you. As Mr. Rucker observed at the beginning, this was a long trial. It lasted many weeks. I didn't know it was that many witnesses. It felt like more, but that's still a big number. Um, as Mr. Corey observed, um, we had a jury that listened and watched and um, paid attention to what was presented by both sides over these many weeks. And there was a presentation, a robust presentation from both sides. And this jury, along with the attorneys and Mr. MacGyver and perhaps Mr. MacGyver's sister, really the only people, with all due respect to Ireland and Australia, etc., who absorbed all of the evidence that was presented in this case. It's helpful to have the armchair jurists who, after the fact, say this is how it should have played out or that. Uh, it was a miscarriage of justice or um, it was the right answer or this or that. What the jury said in the end was that it was not an accident. The jury concluded that you, Mr. MacGyver, intentionally pulled the trigger of that firearm, not with the intent to kill your wife and the family matriarch for Corey Enterprises, but that you intentionally pulled the trigger. And they delivered a verdict that supported that conclusion. I do believe, um, consistent with what Ms. Clark Palmer said, that if you, in fact, love Diane MacGyver as much as you've just shared with me um, and others have shared with me through the letters and what we heard at trial, then there really isn't a form of punishment that any judge could impose that would be more severe than the burden of knowing that you took Diane MacGyver from all of us. I didn't know her before the trial. I feel like I know more about her, but it's clear in listening to Mr. Corey and Mr. Grover and Ms. Williams and Ms. Carter and others who testified during the trial that um, she was family to those people. Um, as we mean that term, not a blood relative, but just as much as a blood relative. And you took Diane MacGyver from all of them as well. Their loss in many ways is, is the same. I'll tell you what's, what's most telling. You had as much time as you wanted to share with me um, what you thought was important for me to hear and I guess your audience to hear. Um, you heard about racehorses in Australia and Chick-fil-A and telepathy, a brief psychoanalysis of the male ego and, and ghosts. I didn't ever hear you say you're sorry for what you did. 
to me, that silence speaks volumes. Mr. MacGyver, the sentencing options are largely determined by the legislature in this case. The penalty for felony murder is life. I'm going to sentence you count two to a term of life with the possibility of parole. Count three merges into count two. Count four must run consecutive to count two. It must be five years. I will suspend those five years. Count five is a range of one to five. <clears throat> Excuse me. I will sentence you to five years to serve. That will run concurrently with count two. The sentence I just intended to pronounce is a sentence of life plus five with those five years suspended.